All right, we have a very special guest with us today. He is considered one of the more revered characters within the core surfing world, a professional surfing career that was marked by an enviable power-based approach as well as off-the-grid exploration. Originally hailing from Ventura County, he and his two brothers, Keith and Dan, both lineup podcast alumni, rose to prominence in the early 90s in competition through free surfing videos, representing major surf brands, and really expressing a life of uncanny connection to both the land and the sea. Transitioning from a career in front of the lens to one behind it, his passion for both filmmaking and conservation led to his work through the Moonshine Conspiracy Company and films like A Broke Down Melody, Thicker Than Water, September Sessions, The Fisherman's Son, and 180 Degrees South, just to name a few. He's worked on global ad campaigns for Ford, Jeep, Ram, Coors, Patagonia, Toyota, Gerber, and he is an ambassador for Leatherman and Yeti. Very happy to have him on this week's episode. It is Chris Malloy. Chris, thank you so much for coming on the lineup. Hey, super, super excited to catch up with you guys and and um, talk some story. And yeah, I, I uh, super appreciate being here. Awesome. And we were catching up just a little bit before we recorded, but always curious when we do these digitally, like where are you calling us from today? Like where are you based at the moment? Yeah, I'm in, um, we live in Los Alamos, California. Um, it's about, uh, I don't know, 40 minutes north of Santa Barbara inland, about 15 minutes off the coast. So yeah, quiet little town. There's a stop sign um, going into town and one going out and um yeah, it's a great little town. It it um, it survived the era of just like dozing, mm-hmm. um, you know, downtown and putting in like a Home Depot. It survived that, um, and the little the, the little old houses and st- stores um, have been kind of like a next generation has kind of come in, and and so there's a neat little community of kind of ag minded, forward thinking characters in in the town. A lot of trade. Um, you know, if somebody's just done a steer, you know, and somebody is a making wine, you might, you know, beef for wine or, um, my, my dear friend, Stephanie, she's always, you know, she, she's, um, she fishes for a living. And so she'll, um, when she goes, comes, you know, back from farmer's markets on Sundays, we we're the benefactors of like whatever she didn't sell. So she'll just show up with you know, my friend Rob Defoe's wine and some of her, you know, oysters or lobster or sea urchin. And so it's fun. It's a fun little community. Um, yeah, it's quiet, pretty quiet. It's, it's for those of us that are fortunate enough to, I mean, uh, even on a small scale, like engage in a little bit of a barter economy. It's amazing how well it works, right? Where it's like, I've got this thing, I don't need it. or I've got too much of it. You've got that thing. I do need that. Like in, and like even kind of your conversation or your point on, you know, Los Alamos surviving, you know, Home Depot going downtown or whatever it is. It is funny with humanity because like we're, we're always on this like rocket train of progression. But I always like to think like sometimes you end up in a cul-de-sac where it's like you didn't need to go there. Like we can go back to something that maybe worked a little bit better. I'm wondering if you ever kind of have any thoughts on that, especially with the lifestyle you have at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. I think like the like the. You know, I get overwhelmed with like, you know, I've worked a ton with like NGOs and and in these these big funds, right? To 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 make change and stuff. And to right. be honest, like, I don't, I don't, um, I don't, I've never gone out and like done a um, protest. Hmm. You know, I, I've never, I'm not good with working with a myriad of of organization, man. Like, right. and so, and that can, you can, you know, you always, you always want to help how you can and, and, and help support, you know, the, the, those causes. But for me, it's like, at the end of the day, it really what you can do, like right in your community, you know, mm-hmm. where, like, and, and keep track of like your progress over a decade. Right. You know, it's not about, for me personally, it's like, I don't give a shit about your, 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 uh, bamboo straw or whatever, you know, like, right. I, I, I feel like, you know, my dad would be viewed as like, sort of, you know, like rednecky or something, you know, but really he was practical, you know, mm. he was practical. And, the, and, the, and I think, 
you know, I'm always going to, if somebody has something to, to talk about in terms of like the health of a watershed or, or, right. or a, a tidal zone, like I'm dang sure going to look at their hands before I keep listening. You know, I, yeah. I, I if, if, if their hands don't show that they're living it and doing it, um, I don't care about, I, I get myself in trouble here, but I don't give a shit about your PhD. Mm. If you're not, if, and, 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 you know, you're telling me about a place and what I should do and what I shouldn't do and the, the counts on fish or birds or whatever. And, and, and I can just see clearly um, that it's not something that they're doing. I'm, I'm not going to be prone to listen a ton because I've been around that a lot. And okay. so um, anyway, it's just like I feel like it's a being mindful over the decades rather than big giant um, initiatives. There's a place for those too, um, but that's sort of not, um, doesn't work as well for me. <laughs> no, it's, I'm, it's interesting to hear you talk about that too, because I'd imagine that it just as a sample set of one, like certainly over the last 20 years in the information age, like I, and I'd imagine most of us have been exposed to so many things everywhere right and sure. it's easy to get disconnected from like being in the present being a good person and being a good family member and being a good community you know what i mean where it's like there are tangible things that are probably falling by the wayside for a lot of us because we're just like oh my gosh did you hear about the situation in x location did you and not to not to dismiss the importance of any of that but to right. your point i think that there's such a disconnect there sometimes in terms of actually being able to do something actionable that makes an impact. And when that doesn't happen, I think that leads to kind of a broad distrust of organizations in general, right? Because you're like, oh well, man, I, you know, I listened to this person. I tried to do these things. I don't know if it worked or not. And then someone's telling me it didn't kind of thing. And yeah, I don't know. I, just hearing you talk about it and hearing you talk about being able to be you know, a part of a community and measuring your own impact over time. Like, you know, I think that's an equally, if not more valuable way to consider well, activism is a dirty word, but just sort of living like a productive life. Sure. Sure. And I think, I think again, it, you know, it can, everybody's brain works differently, mm, you know, and yeah. some people can be on every flyer and at every right. event and go to all the protests and, you know, th that works for them. You know, and they're they're vocal in their own way, and um, and we need that. You know, we need that. I, I'm just such a so like uh, like what is it called? Like ADHD or something? Right. I don't know what they what they call uh, it or whatever. But it just works for me to 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 um, you know, like for instance, you know, I've shown um probably done, you know, a couple thousand premieres of our, of our films over the years. And when I do something that's involved um, with agriculture, mm. when I introduce the film, I always start with like, all right, folks, like I'm, I'm here with Wes Jackson and Dan O'Brien. These are guys are scientists, authors, experts. I'm a filmmaker. Like I, like I, I make films about things and people that inspire me. Mm. Um, and because I live on some dirt out here and we're blessed enough to produce a little bit of food for ourselves and our community, um, I'm not an expert in agriculture, you know. So I feel like, you know, rather than a protest or, or, or something like that, like I share my message through the, through the film, you know, through the yeah. film. And with, when, when we do, when we do uh, conservation minded film, I always say that my job is to um, find the voices, get out of their way and let them be them and, and just just harness and channel um, their life's work, you know, so. Yeah. You know, um, I, I don't know if it was in Surfing or Surfer, and I've, I attribute this quote to you every few weeks, probably on this podcast um, from when I was a kid. And I, I was an interview with you and, and someone was sort of asking you about the, the idea of being a professional surfer and, and, and probably coming from, you know, Ventura County and the Central Coast area. Mm -hmm. you, you know, they were picking at that a little bit in terms of like, well, we're selling out or whatever. And you said something to the effect of, I hope you said it, I've quoted you so many freaking times. Um, 
I can either hammer nails to go surfing or I can go surfing to go surfing. Um, so I, I thought that was pretty profound um, at the time. And I thought it was like a great justification for like the idea of professional surfing because it's like, yeah, this is like the funnest thing ever. Like if someone's going to pay me to do it and I get to do it more, that's great. Um, two questions. Is that something you remember saying or would have said? Um, and then secondly, how do you feel about that comment now in 2024? Sure. I do remember saying that. Oh, and good. Okay. This is good. <laughs> I, do, I do remember saying, I was a kid, you know, when I said yeah. that. And so it was, it was, there was no foresight in my answer. It was like, right. I forget. Um, I forget who asked that question, but that was sort of, yeah. I mean, for me, it was like, I was going to, I was going to drive a dozer, you know, a run a dozer and for my dad or, and, um, and then like coming from Mohai, like the idea of, of making a living surfing was just like, you know, surreal, right? Mm, you know, yeah. we, would, we would come down with a van full of kids, and, like go to Rincon, sit in the cove and watch Curran with these like inc incredible boards. And like, um, man, as a, as a 13 year old, how are you not going to just dream of that? You know? Right. And so, um, yeah, I think, I think looking back on it, like I still stand by that, you know, like, if, right, yeah, if yeah. I can, yeah, if I can, um, I, I, but I did feel some responsibility though. So it was like, okay, all of a sudden the, the timing worked out right. And, you know, and everything just clicked and the surfing industry at that time was just like right. such a interesting place. But then, so then you get like the, all right, like, and you're sponsored, you're paid, you're, you're getting, you know, paid good to do this and, and bought, you know, and it was like, spin the globe, really go, right. go. And at that time, man, there was so much left, but then you, you know, you, you start going, okay, well, am I cheating on my, mm -hmm. my wife at this point? Because you, at that same time, you're like watching surfing just go crazy in terms of the industry and stuff. And so that was a big kind of like gut check and kind of like that was the shift of like, I'm going to, I want to show surfing through my experiences mm. <clears throat> and, and it had given, you know, surfing had, um, had changed my life so much and my family's life so much. It was like, that was the impetus for us to like start making films because, um, you know, like it, it was like, well, what was happening surfing wasn't really a reflection of the films at that time weren't a reflection of the experience, you know? And then right. also that was a, a, a period, this is like 25 years ago now, but like looking at, you know, I was spending a lot of time with Yvonne Chouinard at yeah. Patagonia as friends, you know, and um, spitballing and uh, on ideas and, and just kind of watching um, his mindset it, that had a lot to do with like really caring about like surfers and surfing and going, Hey, there's some incredible things happening. Um, and that like taking that leap, um, leaving, leaving, essentially leaving Bob Hurley, mm -hmm. who was, and still is one of my, you know, dear, dear friends and, and, yeah. and heroes. And, um, but to leave that, to, to go with Patagonia was like, we got laughed at so heavily, my brothers and I, for making that move, you know? Um, people were like, what are you, what is that like a Frisbee company? Like, what are you guys, what is that? You know, chastised even, you know? Yeah. And um, that had a lot to do with like, hey, you have this opportunity to get paid to surfing. What are you gonna do with it? You know, like you, 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 like my goal is just to get as barreled as I possibly could. Um, but then all of a sudden you're like kind of in a like limelight in a way as a, as a pro surfer. And, and it's like, are you going to say anything? Are you going to just right. keep getting barreled until people don't care about you getting barreled anymore? Like you have that like, like little window to like, you know, and so I wanted to like, again, not beat people over the head with ideas. Um, but like, Hey, this is, this has enriched our lives and um, we're all having kids and, you know, like, right. what are we going to, what are you going to sit there in 20 years 
with with your with your family and 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 say this is my life's work you know what's your what's your life's work and so um yeah so it was a kind of a an evolution but yeah that whole thing i i think i said i could either swing a hammer you know or 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 go get barreled and so yeah if i was if i was the true um you know if i i could have i could have got a good job in Ojai um, and surfed on the weekends. And that would probably would have been a cool, cool way to, to run it too, though. I don't know. I don't know. What was the other part of that question? No, I just, I just loved hearing you talk about it in, in those terms. Like it, 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 I guess the other part you kind of answered is like, no, I stand by it today, but it, it's, it is interesting because you see this across a number of like, you know, really elite high level surfers. And it's probably not unique to surfing. It probably happens everywhere. But I think in surfing, people love to like lionize and limelight and platform. Like, you know, it's a, it's a community obsessed with the cult of youth, like very, very young stars. And when we're all young, we're like, yeah, I want to travel. I want to do this. Like you haven't had a lot of like formative experiences, you know, maybe like the money's important, et cetera. But you know, you answered that very eloquently. Like, as you got older, you're like, w- what am I going to stand for in a way? Not not in like a beat your chest kind of way, but just like, there's probably has to be more than this, you know? And, and I see it in, in other ways too, at some point, and maybe it's having kids, maybe it's just being exposed to different ways of living, but it's just like, this was fun, but, but you know, I, I, it can't just be this pursuit of fun exclusively for the rest of my life. Um, but it's interesting to hear you kind of articulate that so well. Yeah, well, I hope I hope it made sense. And I think, like, at the end of the day, like, the guys and girls that I look up to um, aren't beating their chest, and they're uh, they're they're living their life in a in a way that um, is you know inspiring people to sort of think, just think, like, start there, you know, think and go, hey, you know, I guess. For all the things that I lack and one thing that has, I'm pretty good at is if like I get an idea and I see like a path to pulling something off um, that doesn't seem like it's doable and if I just put my head down and go for it, um, I sometimes pull it off, you know, and, and so, you know, again, like whether it's like shifting and how we're, you know, building board shorts as simple as that or wetsuits or whatever, like you know, with having the, you know, like-minded people, my brothers and Yvonne and, you know, there's a whole list, Devin Howard and it's a bunch of people that are like, Hey, you know what? There's a better way. Yeah. Let's go for it. You know, I, I, I refer back to the time I was, I got to be guest editor at surfer magazine and it was myself and Jack Johnson. So the first thing I went in there was like, <laughs> I was bull in the China shop, man. Like I could just see Rick Irons just going on. Oh, no. <laughs> You know, we had shared plenty of surfs at, at, at Pipeline together, and we were always, you know, in the best of ways. But I was like, okay, first thing is we're going to do this thing on recycled paper. He's like, oh, that's impossible. It's possible. It won't work. And I'm like, have you asked your, the, the people that supply the, the paper? And, um, and so a few days went by, and Rick was awesome enough to – call me and be like, you're never going to believe this. It's totally available. Same, same producer. And so that issue went um, recycled. And then all the, all the, the magazines under, under that label at the time, like four mags changed. And, you know, um, and so it was just like a surfer asking a question. That's all it took. It didn't take, you know, and so there's so many, there's so much stuff like that floating around that. And so I'm always just like, trying to channel the, the, the people that, um, you know, that I, that I, that I look up to, you know, just, and they're just, it's always the quiet one, just doing badass every day. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's this like really interesting phenomenon, I, I think in surfing, if you look over the last like few decades of like, and, and it, it, in a lot of ways it makes natural sense, but you kind of have like very, very high profile surfers that are around for a bit and then they, they, in a way, kind of like evolve and move into the wilderness in a way, um, both literally and figuratively. You know, you can, you can argue Dave Rostovich and, and you and your brothers, et cetera. But, but in your case, I'm curious, um, 
since you, you're you're living pretty close to where you grew up in a lot of ways and living how you grew up in a lot of ways very similarly, did you ever kind of like depart from that at, at any point in your professional career? Did you like move to Orange County or are you just spending a ton of time like, you know, in the entirety of the surfing industrial complex? Or did you already have always have like kind of a strong connection to home? Yeah, I for sure um, would would spend time down in Orange County. Um, of course, yeah. Well, you know, what's funny is that like I was just down there. I was just down there for the Ohana Fest, first time in Orange County, and I can't remember when. And like, you know, my my little son, like, you know, he he takes off. They put us up at that place called the ranch. So nice. And my nine year old took off and um, he had a head count on ducks and, and fish in the, in, in that watershed with in, in like half an hour, you know? And then we went and like did the tide pools. It was lobster. It was uh, lobster opened that time. So my older son, you know, like went and came back. We're in Laguna in a, in a hotel and he's got like harvested. So my point is, is that like, I don't feel like I ever, like what, I've never right, found right. a place that I didn't, wasn't able to kind of tap into kind of what, what's happening, you know, and, and um, on a subtle level, you know, like uh, just definitely, um, you know, I've made, I've been, some of my travel buddies have always laughed because, and I don't realize I'm doing it, but whenever we come to a headland, um, anywhere in the world I, or, 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 you know, a, a river mouth or something. I'm always from the way my dad was growing up. I'm always like, where would I live? Where would the indigenous, you know, the first, the first people like, where would you set up camp, you know? And so, so many times I'll like walk around, look around and like kind of go, I think this would be the spot, water, high ground, wind to my back. And then almost always you, you start finding, you find a midden in it and you find pieces of arrowheads and stuff that's been worked. And, you know, my friend's like, well, man, you're, that's like some Indiana Jones. And I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. It's just sort of like, like, what do you see when you, when you look out, right? Like what, it, are you curious? If you're curious, then it's like, how are, how are you going to go on these surf trips that we did? This is, there was no internet. There's no cell phone. So, if you don't go to these to the places and you're not curious about um, this that everything, um, you're going to be bored, you know. And so to like figure out what birds are happening in that zone and and go go, you know, that was just like it was just like yeah. There's no Instagram, man. You just go like find stuff and meet people, and that was definitely. I guess just the, the approach. That's how, how my dad was, you know, everything was, was um, just soaking into where you are understanding that you're, this is not your place and, and um, just soaking it in, soaking it in place. I think that's enjoyable. That's awesome. I think it's a good prompt for all the listeners too, where it's like, yeah, if you do end up somewhere near like a headland or the side or a riverbank, it is, try to figure out where the indigenous people would have set up camp as uh, it's probably a better use of everyone's time as opposed to like, I wonder if DoorDash is going to deliver out here. Um, but we're going to, we're going to take a quick break to get a word in from our sponsors and we'll be right back. All right, we're back. This is the lineup podcast. I'm Dave Prodan here with Chris Malloy. Chris, you know, we talk so much and you had so many great insights and stories about, you know, your upbringing in, in the first segment there. But can you expand a little bit more on that? Like, where were you born and raised? What did mom and dad do? You know, siblings, like, like give us sort of the Genesis version of your life, if you can. Let's see. It's funny. Um, I feel it's funny you ask that because I feel like for so many years, there was just like no looking back, you know? Oh, okay. You, you hit 50. My son just turned 18. Got a 15 year old daughter and nine year old. So you do start, you do, do start thinking about it, you know? And right. so my dad was a, a um, drove heavy equipment. So my first years were, I moved around a little bit. So um, I think from, I think I was, I was born in Los Angeles. Um, 
And then I think within six, so my dad had a job in Santa Monica, like doing underground pipeline. And then right after that was um, a Tascadero. And then we didn't settle in Ojai till I was probably, let's see, um, I think five or six maybe or something. So grew up, grew up in Ohio, you know, so that would have been in the late seventies and, and then early eighties and, um, probably yeah, pretty like, different to how it is now. Oh, <laughs> oh gosh, it's, it is, it is so, so different. And, you know, growing up, people would say, where are you from? And <clears throat> I'd say, oh, And it just like crickets, you know, so I just say Ventura because people would say, right, Ohio, right, right. Yep. Ohio, what, you know, and I, you know, it was, at that time, it was just this cool little, like, kind of felt like, a, you know, it's like a mountain town, really. And it was like hippies, cowboys, the Hells Angels. There was just like such a neat, you know, world in Ohio. And then, so, yeah, now it's it's different, but the classics are still there, man. The, the classics are still there. And Uncle Dan is holding it down for for uh, reality in some ways. And so, yeah, you do, when you go to Ohio, now you see, um, it's like a parody of, of what, what it used to be, you know, but, um, or a caricature, you know, but it's okay. Everybody's getting theirs, man. It's like, it is what it is. The mount, the mountains are still the mountains. The islands are still the islands and no, and, and, and the, the Instagram Ohio types and stuff, they don't go anywhere. They go to their <laughs> coffee shop and back home and, and then, you know, send out stuff about uh, how people should be or live, whatever. Sure. You know? right. Yeah, right. But, uh, but, but yeah, those were, the, the, those were informative years for me. Um, you know, like you'd have my dad's friends come over and they would you know, tell great hunting stories about being up in the Sespe, which is the main watershed behind Ojai. And to us, that was like, Africa it was like such a Montana. It just felt so huge. And then go down to the harbor, and and, and my dad had this incredible like ability to just, just like just see somebody. And and my dad was a good storyteller. And so we got we were just tagging along with him, right? You know, um, I think he was twenty one when he had me. So he was still on a full blown adventure when he had these three little boys. So we were getting. You know, whether it was a junkyard in a Tascadero or, um, you know, a branding pin in Cuyama or uh, Baja with some, you know, crazy characters like we were we we thought my dad and all the guys that he hung out like that's how like that's how you, that's like, you know, that's 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 it. You know, that's 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 cool. And, there, and it was there was always music. And there was always food and there was always, um, you know, fire and, and, and there's, you know, music and guitars floating around. And I think it's like super simple. We're just doing what we like, what our hero did, what our dad did and what all his crazy buddies did, you know, and they were, they were, um, you know, we might be in Baja one week surfing with my dad, you know, or, or um, and the next week, um, you know, chasing cows in Cuyama with my cousins. And, and, um, I mean, it just seemed normal and it, and it still does, you know, it still does. It's, I feel like the one thing that the surf industry does and it's in surf media and it, I've been very blessed and, but the, um, so many surfers are like parking lot, tread, come back and you're gone, which is, which is fine, which is great. Everybody, that's the beauty of surfing. Everybody has their own, like, you know, deep reason why they keep coming back to it, you know? And so the, the guy that's really like got the, <laughs> that, you know, is like, he talks about surfboards and leaders and right. can do the turn. Like, man, that's one more happy person in the world. And I'm not going to fuck with that. You know, like that is awesome. And for us, like the, our terrain <clears throat> um, offers just like a ton of, ton of options. And so, it's all an extension of that feeling you get when you when you get barreled, you know, like you can have that same feeling in the hills, you know, you can, you can, you know, what, what it's, it's, it's just an extension of, of, of that feeling that you're chasing and surfing, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's so interesting to hear you talk about 
like just what a diverse array of activities you were exposed to as a kid. And I'm curious because, you know, now you have like that great debate between like generalists and specialists and like specialists in like youth sports or whatever it is. And it's like, oh, my daughter's going to play soccer. She's going to train at soccer six days a week or whatever, you know, and it's like, that's the whole goal. And they don't get exposed to other things. And in a lot of ways they become successful because that's all they do. But in other ways, they're not as balanced for you and your brothers. It's not like you lived at the beach. It's not like you surfed eight hours every single day, mm-hmm. but you still became you know, elite level surfers, just from an ability standpoint, I'm Mm -hmm. curious if you have any thoughts on that. And then secondly, like there are kids who are just like generally very good at everything, like athletics wise. I'm wondering if there's an element of that for you and your brothers, because obviously surfing isn't your only kind of passion. Yeah, I think, you know, you know, people can say, well, if you're not like surfing or doing a specific sport all day, every day with good coaching, from the time of like 10 on, like you're never going to, you never, never going to get there. Um, but I would say for us, like if you've taken a city bus from downtown Ojai down Ventura Avenue in the eighties with your backpack and you got to surf inside point all day, like that was huge, man. That was like such an adventure for, for me and for us. And I, I remember um, there were some surfers in you know, growing up, um, this, you know, Tommy Raftikin, Ty Olson, um, just a, a bunch of guys. They were so good and so ahead of us by the time that we like showed up from Ojai. Like, I mean, Keith's first surf contest, he was on a single fin, you know, and it was like laughed at, you know, and it wasn't a style or decision. It was the board that he got his hands on. And so by the time um, a lot of these kids, man, they're burnt out by the time they're, uh, you know, 14. So we, we really, we really like the idea of getting to surf somewhere other than California street or Emma Wood, like it just was this just such an exciting time. And I think that we took it seriously and we, um, we wanted to like prove to ourselves that we could, hang tough and and like we just committed you know we just committed to it and um and i think that athletically yeah we definitely like there's a there's a limit on that right so mm-hmm. like no matter how hard you try if you don't have the tools you know it probably isn't gonna you know you probably can't go and, and I, I think we we um i don't know having brothers man you're always you're always throwing a ball around you're always having some kind of a contest to see who can do this. And so you just kind of like, you just kind of, our whole, our whole family's athletic, you know, everybody's, everybody's athletic. And I would say for me personally, like I'm out of all the Malloy's probably not the most talented for sure, but like it just, you get, you know, you make up for it in your, in your will to try, you know? So, um, yeah, I, I, I think that, that, you know, they talk about like, you know, your childhood and how with, with these sports at this level, like, I feel like the kids are robbed of getting to figure out a lot of the stuff themselves. And just like, man, the magic of sitting there with two of your best friends, <clears throat> you know, waiting for the tide to drop. So you just start having a contest so you can throw a, a rock the farthest in the lineup and like, hours and hours and hours of that stuff, like meaningless stuff that in the, in the, as the years go on, you're like, man, I miss that stuff. I want that for, for kids to just sit there and be little idiots and figure it out, you know? And, and um, yeah, uh, it's, it's interesting to watch the progression of surfing and young surfers. It's amazing. I'm excited for all of them there. You know, you've got 12 year olds getting bit bigger barrels than, any grown up that I, you know, that right. I was around. And so that's exciting. I'm excited for them. I think that, um, intention is, is, and, and really like is important. And I think the kids, these days, their parents are, you know, it's gotta be careful if the parents making the decision hmm. for the kid or if it's coming from them. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's interesting. Talk to me a little bit about your relationship with the North Shore, because as a fan of you growing Mm -hmm. up, it felt like 
amongst that, that entire generation of surfers, you seem like you made a real impact in the waves there. And I wonder too, just having the privilege of hearing you kind of talk about your perspectives and your upbringing, if, you know, the North Shore's community and country community was maybe a factor in you, you doing as well as you did over there. Yeah. So I remember my dad, um, so my dad had gone to a couple years of a college on Maui called Mona Olu, which I, I don't think is still there, but he came back with these, these folkloric stories of the Hawaiians, you know, of, of, really he talked about Honolulu Bay and Malaya, but he talked about the people, you know, and, um, and so it just sort of all, came, for me personally, it all came together just growing up hearing about the Hawaiians and then, um, and then starting to get to see some of, some of the early surf films, um, it just, man. And then I just, I'll remember, I'll always remember, um, I had lost like a, a, a semi-final heat in like Huntington beach. I don't know what it was like a PSAA or something. And I was so frustrated and you know, I'm, I, I'm about 200 pounds and the surf was like knee high and I just, just kept losing and losing. And I was so frustrated and I, and I walked into um, it. What, what, what's Pi's big surf shop down there? Is that Huntington oh, Beach? H S and S, yeah, the Pi. H S S. So I remember walking in there and just and just like so didn't know what to do, man. I was just and then I just look up and Derek Ho just takes off on this wave that's like just missed the second reef and those ones just load up. Those are just like the you know they just load up and Derek just whoo, and getting in and just. And I'll never forget it. I mean, we've all seen those waves of his a lot, but I'll never forget that. And I it's just thought to myself, what in the fuck am I doing at Huntington Beach? This is over. I'm not doing this anymore, you know? And so, yeah, I cut, I cut um, uh, firewood for my dad, saved up. I worked for um, Al at the, you know, sweeping shaping bays. I had 1200 bucks, 18. That was the end of that, man. And, you know, lucky enough um, to to have, uh, you know, the Hill family really, really took us in. I mean, you know, Corey Hill, she raised um, 20, 20 guys from Sonny Garcia to Kelly to Shane, Rob, you know, her son, Ronald, like we're all still in good touch and we're all, you know, from those formative days, you know, we, it really, really gave us the opportunity as kids. Cause when I went over there, I wasn't making any money. Mm -hmm. So Duncan Campbell gave me free breakfast every morning. Me and Todd Chester was my roommate. So he gave us breakfast. Corey would let us stay there. Then we would go down to Mokulaia. Jesse Lovett would let us all crash there and, um, you know, we, I lived at, at the, at the V-Land, um, center block houses for a couple of years with Mike McHale. I just had those opportunities to like, to just surf hard when it got good and when it got big and it, and it, and it felt like something was happening, you know, it was like, like, you know, Tommy, um, Carol and Potts and all those guys were getting like a little older, you know, like. You know, you'd still be in the lineup with Dan K. Aloha and Jerry Lopez mm. and Roger Erickson might walk by, you know, there, and there's Peter Cole. Like it was this crazy time in surfing where it just seemed like felt right. And it felt like, man, I'm like, I'm not, nobody's giving me waves at, at pipe except for closeouts, <laughs> but I'm f***ing stoked, man. Let's go. Like, go, let's go. And, and just, it just felt it just felt good, you know, and lucky enough to have like, somehow I got on Marvin Foster's good side, you know, and that was like, all it took is like, people know uh, you're cool with Marvin. So then you're kind of, you're okay. <laughs> you know, unless it's like an incredible transgression, like keep your head down, know your place um, and know that you are out there to get what's left just that mentality was so work wonders for my brothers and I, because we, we were like, Hey, we're going to surf all day and um, we're not going to get in anybody's way. And we're going to, 
you know, um, we're going to go. When you give us a chance, we're going to go. And, and, and I think that, that that served us well, you know, that, that served us well as, uh, by keeping our heads down and knowing our place. Um, and yeah, I mean, what a gift Pipeline is. It was, you know, now it's like, imagine, so now these kids are out there doing these incredible things all over the world in giant surf, you know, and they, they, they do a spinner on a 80 foot wave. And then, and then it's like the, it's huge. It gets posted on you know Monday and by Wednesday it's gone. Right. Yeah. You know, and that kid, that's like a, that's a lifetime achievement that was like, like people cared about for like 48 hours. Whereas for our generation, it was like the whole world was pipeline and way man. So there was no jaws. There was no Mavericks. There was one big, big open water wave. I mean, everybody talked about stuff like, was it Pico Alto in Peru and Toto Santos was, was starting to happen. And, and, um, but like back to pipeline, it was like, if you, if you surf pipe all winter and, and got a few, like that was being noticed. People were taking note of that. And, you know, and for me to, to get that support at one point from Bob Hurley allowed me to go, okay, well, winter's all pipeline. And then, you know, then we, then we find Chopu. So that's like a month out of every summer. And then that's right. When Martin started taking us through the mentalized so it was like and that that right there with a couple trips thrown in with um every year you know new caledonia or okinawa or ireland or you know just was like man that was like a good rhythm for you know almost two decades so yeah yeah but it all starts in hawaii and i'd love to hear um that you know and, and see that pipeline still is you know it's not like why man um, in a way, it's like everything. You know, it's 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 more it's more Jaws these days as it as right. it should be. Um, my man is still magic, still still the spot. But um, I think pipeline even more so is that if you can't do it at pipe, then you got a problem if you're trying to um, hustle the surf deal. You know. Yeah, it's so interesting to hear you talk about that because, and it's not exclusive to surfing, but like you really. I don't want to say you hit because obviously you worked hard to get it, but like all your experiences happened at such a unique moment in time in surfing, right? Like there was sort of the the big money, like nineties and two thousands industry was getting really big. It, it could afford all these trips, et cetera. There weren't, you know, there was no social media. There wasn't just tens of thousands of 12 year olds out there getting clips and, and et cetera. You know, the mental wise was largely like, um, unoccupied in a lot of ways. And, um, I don't know. It's just, it's just awesome hearing you talk about it because for people that might revere you or, or, or look up to you or, or just be huge fans of you, it's not possible to replicate the way you did things just because the world has changed so much in so many ways. You know, the mentalize is, uh, far from unoccupied at this point is another way to think about it. Yeah, it was, it was looking back on, um, on it. It was a very unique time. And, and, you know, I, I've talked to my brothers about the fact that, like, as, quote, pro surfers, um, we hit it. I feel like we hit it at the best time because all of our heroes were either selling weed on the side or married well. or But they were the top of the heap in pro, in pro surfing, but they still had a side hustle. You know, they still had something going on. And when we when we came in. A guy could make um, enough money to do go surf all year, um, buy a pickup truck, and then if he's smart, squirrel away a little bit of money. But why I say it's the best is that it's still, at least for us, it, you had to stay honest, you know, with your money. Like you didn't have assistance. You got your plane ticket paid for it, but you still crashed on somebody's couch, you know, 90% of the time. And so I feel like, then you move ahead where kids are making millions and millions of dollars. And like, in a way that's, that's amazing. But sometimes I wonder, you know, now with, with how much surfers make, like, you know, are they getting a little bit robbed of that experience that like the passing of the torch from 
like the, the the elders that we grew up with, you know, like they they I remember Mark Fu, you know, one day out at um, Phantoms, like just this amazing day. It was Mark Mark Fu, Donnie Solomon, Todd Chesser. And I remember this one set came in and, and nobody was in position and it just we were sitting there on the right and the thing and the thing just detonated and we could see see right through the barrel and it was like and then revelations is in the background and like and then i remember mark looking at me and being like you realize that there's like we're the only people in the world that get to witness this you know and that was that was about eight months before he passed but like i feel like um it was a time that we got we got that um experience with the elders and that's what's ingrained in us in a, in, a, in one way or another and i think that if we had been making uku dinero i'd think that we you know you inevitably kind of you lose you that footing a little bit you know um so i don't know i, I feel like we we were you know, very very lucky with with timing in the world and um and i and i liked that you know not a, like compared to now um Surfing was still sort of like not a thing in the world, right. you know, it was not a thing. And so I liked it. I, I liked it. I like that, you know, and, and I'm, it's really fun to watch it get so massive. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, if people are surfing, the world's a better place. So, you know, I'm... <laughs> It's a good way to look at it. I, I completely agree with you on, um, and I don't fault anybody, right? Because you know, at the end of the day, it's like you got to cash the checks. But it, that that it the pursuit of professional surfing when you and your brothers came up, and and certainly it would have been different even thirty years before that. But it meant something different. It was like it's a permission system to say, well, I've got someone funding me to go to Hawaii. Once I'm there, I'm on my own, and I'm going to have the experiences that are actually the more important than the money for me. Right. Um, so there's that element of it, but there's also kind of like the atmospheric element to it. Like I, I, I'm always fascinated just by like the socioeconomics in Australia with surfing, right? Because in World War II, the coastal property was the cheapest because the country was worried about being invaded from Japan. So that's where you had all the government housing and the lower income families, et cetera. So since they were so close to the beach, a lot of their families and their descendants and then, you know, kids and grandkids, those were the ones that got really, really good at surfing. So you had this generational system in Australia where the best surfers were really from working class. Mm -hmm. And you can draw a line back to the fact that, yeah, because coastal property was the cheapest back then because of World War II, whereas now coastal property everywhere is the most expensive. And it's kind of like, it's almost impossible to replicate that experience without having a ton of money yeah 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 and i think um it'll be interesting to 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 see and that goes back to the like the, the kids that you know and the you know if you if you have everything um you um it's almost like you got to work to stay stoked and appreciative yeah. you know whereas if you you know, you got to, it's a haul to even get the chance to do it, you know, um, like it's a precious, precious time, you know, it, it is precious time. And so, yeah, what we find um, in, in, in our region is that um, because, you know, the, the commercial fishermen or the weed growers and all that, those kind of people, the salt of the earth characters, like, um, the guys that are surfing and on top of it, holding it down at their spots, like can't live there anymore. Right. And strangely enough, I find it to be less crowded up here because there's the big homes on the beach are essentially vacation homes. Um, and so those days that are um, like head high and there's not some big report, like you can get it with just, the crew, you know, you get it with yeah. just the crew most of the time. If you have like a touted, you know, you know, big swell and it's a weekend, it's shot. It's just, you're good. You're going to do something else that day. Um, so that's been a shift. It's not, it's not so much like of an easy, an even flow on like, you're probably going to go know who's in the lineup tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. Now it's like, there'll be ghost town. And then, you know, uh, 
just the barrage of people that have bought the house, they got the board, they got the new wife, they got the whole thing, and they come with all their progeny that they only see on the weekends, and they just, boom, you know. And that's that, is what it is, you know. That's why, that's when that's when it's time to go, go spear fishing or something, you know. I mean, yeah. yeah. Mm, makes sense. On that note, we're going to take one more break to get a quick word from our sponsors. And when we come back, we're going to wrap up our conversation with Chris Malloy. We'll be right back. Cool. All right. This is the lineup pod. I'm Dave Prodan here with Chris Malloy. Now, Chris, we were talking during the break about how, you know, um, from your location today, you're hooked up to Starlink. And I was saying, oh, it's a, I got a funny story about that because uh, I turned 40 last year, went on a boat trip to the Mentawise with a bunch of friends. and. You know, we had a great time. We were all, we we're all, you know, dads. So um, we we ended up heading down to this spot called the Hole, kind of down in the the southern end of the archipelago. And um, one of the other boats there had a Starlink system, and and the dads were kind of like, oh, like I just want to. I just want to use it to check in with my kids kind of thing. And the captain was like, no problem, $100 US per person for 30 minutes or whatever. And I'm like, this is good, good piracy happening down in the uh, Indian Ocean here. Yeah, I can, um, I can uh, <clears throat> tell you, there's a, there's a story I remember, Kelly would probably be pissed at me, but we were out with Martin uh, in the zone and uh, it was pre, you know, internet, cell phone right. stuff. And he was um, dating um, Pam at the time. And I swear, he's going to kill me, but I swear he spent like $5,000 on faxing. <laughs> <laughs> he was faxing back and forth with, with her. Um, but yeah, the whole, I tell you what, I feel like to this day, it's like kind of my favorite wave like in the world, really. And um, so my memory of, of it is that it was a kind of a wild trip and i think bob mcknight had maybe surfed it with martin martin was martin was like man that guy we all owe him so much and freaking i love that dude um i haven't seen him in years but so it was a kind of a wild trip um and it was with tommy carroll uh martin potter ross clark jones um, and don king and Horn Baker, it was such a great trip. And um, Tom, Tom, I'd love to hear his version of the story. It was a little bit of a crazy trip, so there was a lot of sidetracking and stuff. But um, he, Tommy, had a name for the spot that was a was like pretty graphic. And so <laughs> my recollection of of it was Mar Martin and and Tommy were in the wheelhouse and. Tommy had this name for it. It was floating around and I came in to kind of mitigate. I'm like, how about we just call it the hole? Like, do you get what I'm saying? Like that just, it'll, I think it's a little less like, you know, I don't know. The other one's pretty rank, you know? So anyway, I, that's my memory of how that spot got named. I'd love to hear what Mark <laughs> and, and Tommy, um, but I, but then fast forward with that way, which truly there's, it's just such a, such a special place. And, and, and um, uh, I was there like 10 years after that, that first trip and uh, got super vibed from these California guys. <laughs> They're like, how'd you find out about the spot? How'd you find out about the hole? <laughs> Just vibey. And I was like, I was with my brothers and, and, and I was actually, yeah, we, we were, we, we were nice, but these just the, just the, you know, the evolution of the, the audacity of these guys. To, to go to the mental wise, be there, they probably there one day and they're like kind of like holding it down for a spot, you know, for their spot, the whole, um, I thought I got, I always got a kick out of that. That's amazing. I mean, surfing's tough, man, with like, it's <laughs> finite, it's finite resources, right? So everyone's a little eggy. Like I, I crack up my, my got 10 year old twins, a boy and a girl, and they got into, um, climbing like a couple of years ago. It was actually during the pandemic and one of the only things that was open is this climbing gym, which is up the street from us here in Oxnard. And, and they got me into it and I, it, I love it, but mm -hmm. I'm always like, 
flabbergasted at the difference in cultures where it's like everyone and obviously like you know the small sample set but like climbers are generally pretty nice and they're just like very like welcoming and like they're happy to give you tips and encourage you and then surfing maybe not so much and i i really feel like it's one of those things where it's like well the the rock and the wall it's always there like this isn't it is a finite resource but not really compared to a wave, right? And everyone's just like, yeah, take your time. And so the cultures just feel really different to that, me. You just brought up, like, reminded me of that exact experience, <laughs> right. really close to your experience. So so my brothers and I, are, we're not climbers, but we have been dragged up some pretty proud, pretty amazing stuff and lived right. with climbers a lot. But I have too much respect for climbers to say you know i'm a climber but i've I've done i've done i've done got to do some some cool so early on i remember um we went out uh to just do some bouldering at joshua tree and i'm with um randy levitt who's just like a legend in climbing super sweet humble guy charges big waves and he was like come on you guys um, because when our first climbing experience really was with Yvonne up in the Cespi and we, right. he would just put like an old Swami belt on you, which is just a belt with a rope <laughs> on it and just be like talking and just like, so, but he's saying he was, that, he, he was wanting to scare us and he did, but then, <laughs> you know, doing it a little bit more, I remember going to Joshua tree and rolling up to this, um, this thing that Randy was going to climb and, um, there's these young guys that kind of our age, these guys are just kind of yoked and they're just standing there. And I, I walked into camp like bowed up, like I, it's like a surf spot in my eyes. And I'm just kind of like, what's these guys deal? Like, what's the deal? <laughs> and they're like, Hey man, how are you? <laughs> right. Hey, yeah. hey, we got extra food. And I remember going to saying to Jeff Johnson, I'm like, this is crazy. Like <laughs> everybody's nice to each other, like, and welcoming. And to your point, like that, 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 that's going to be there. It's been there for about 180,000 years. Um, and it's going to be there. you you don't have to compete. Um, right. so that was super refreshing to, you know, with the climbing I've done in my life, just the, the culture is, is, a uh, it's just super different, at least, you know, outside, you know, I can't speak for the, the gym stuff too much, but it seems like it'd be the same. It's just, yeah. yeah. So that, that is cool. Yeah. You know, you're talking to us a little bit just about the filmmaking part of your career and and a huge part of the professional surfing part was obviously you were a regular feature in the Taylor Steele videos. Um, But then the Moonshine Conspiracy and and the, the films that that group and you work on tonally and structurally very, very different. Can you talk to us just a little bit more about both experiences and maybe how you know, the decision-making process ended up for you kind of moving in that different direction as far as storytelling goes. Sure. Sure. I mean, I, I had always, um, I had always loved the arts, you know, um, literature and, and, and film and painting and drawing. Like that was like always where my mind was going. Whenever, you know, whenever I went to a place, I'd go try to see a show, you know, and I was always just like, so, excited to sit with artists and watch them work and, and, um, and yeah, it really comes down. Like I, I, you know, 1997, I hit the bottom really bad at pipeline Mm. and it looked like I was done with that. And so just opened up this like whole world and like, and like, it was like people like, you know, Craig Stasek, Joe Scott, all these characters. Um, and, Art Brewer and all those guys were just like, oh man, you know, a lot of, a lot of the kids don't give a shit about the stories and about how they were told. And I was just sincerely, I really didn't have in, in, at first the idea of contributing to the story, you know? Um, and then in 97, I got hurt and, and um, I, I, you know, I got lucky and my dear friend who I was like staying on his couch, um, could run a bull ex Jack Johnson, you know? And so Jack, uh, and I, and my cousin just, Emmett just sort of set out and it was really like, I really felt like we were going to make one film and like one and done. Hey, this is what surfing, how I, through our eyes, you know, through like, 
um, I had no idea it would turn into like a career in, in, in filmmaking. Um, and so, you know, my first, the first big part of my life in, in filmmaking was, was the 16 millimeter surf films. Um, and, you know, there, we could afford the way we were making films to disappear for a year and come back with a film for Wallet Up and Down the Coast. Really, um, you know, I remember my dad and Bruce Brown used to hang out, you know, and so I get to sit there and bullshit with those guys. And, and of course, over time, I asked Bruce about filmmaking. I don't think he ever knew I was making surf films, by the way. I never brought it up. Like, you know, this was like, you know, up here. So he, I don't think he ever did, but I would sort of ask him stuff. And, you know, I did an interview with him um, on him one time for the Surfer's Journal. And I remember, you know, he, he'd go back down memory lane, but the only time he showed real emotion um, was when he talked about filling these these small spaces with surfers in a way that brought them together and then also revitalized some little towns, some small towns, like they would show so the movie yeah. the summer played for so long that right. it kind of like got, you know, breathe life back into a little town. Um, and, and like when he said that, I was like, gosh, darn it. That's what, that's what I, at the end of the day, like to fill a room full of, people that are excited and inspired by what they're seeing on the, on the wall projected. Um, that was like enough to sustain me in my, my hopes and dreams in, in filmmaking for over, a, you know, a long time, you know, mm -hmm. and then the evolution of sort of starting to tell stuff that was like, you know, conservation minded and then diving deep into agriculture and all those things. Mm -hmm. Those are, it was like, okay, you know, we have the, we have the floor kind of, and we, we figured out these cameras now we, and we understand the process and lo and behold, we can, we, you know, we can craft a, 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 a story. Um, and then, so then that was the kind of, you know, leading into 180 South and yeah. unbroken ground, groundswell, the fisherman's son. Um, that was like uh, where surfing, if any, took a backseat, you know, and, right. and, the, and the stories being told. And, and so, um, yeah. And then, you know, over time, um, I started having kids and I started going, you know, my partner, Tim Lynch was, um, was working in features and commercials and was always saying, you know, you got it. You, you would be so great in this industry. They need, you know, fresh, fresh talent or whatever, fresh meat. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so I definitely have, you know, I really pushed away from that for so long. And right. what I realized was um, I had so much to learn and I felt like, wow, like I'm getting to, I went from like, you know, here I'm with, with Jack and we're in the Andaman Islands and like, you know, I'm going to go grab him some food and come back and, you know, hope he didn't get malaria and all, which was like, will always be my favorite way of, functioning but then to be on these sets with you know a hundred people right and like the the the, the, the crazy <clears throat> like realization i'm like holy shit, like i'm running this show was right. such a so incredible and i learned so much and gained so much respect for the tried and true filmmakers out there and i've always um dare i make a scorsese reference but he always says um i make one for them and one for me Mm. And like, you know, in a, in a, in a way that's just justifying, um, <laughs> a lot, but man, it, 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 I've never, I've, I've always been able to jump in and, and, and do what I do. Like I really don't conform. And I think that's why I've kind of pigeonholed myself with, like, I, I, I work with real people in real places and like, there's real passion when we, when we make stuff and like, I don't really see the brand as much as I see the experience. And, um, and, uh, our crew doesn't fit in at all, but they know that we, we know the boundaries of, you know, like you, you know, you can drink beer, but how much, you know, we know how we, how we fit into the thing and we, we haven't gotten kicked out yet, but it, it really, that has, 
afforded me the ability to continue my passion projects and to continue making, you know, what I want to make without, um, without like, you know, that thing over your shoulder, like 99% of a lot of the stuff we've made, especially the surfing films is a hundred percent funded by, by us, you know, right. and this is, and especially at the beginning, because this is prior to Jack ever putting out a record or any of that kind of stuff. So like, those, you know, those are when you're young and you don't have, you know, a mortgage and you want to go make something the way you want to make it, man. Do it when you're young and and um, unless you're unless you're, you know, Scorsese, like you're gonna have to find a way to to pay your bills, you know. And and um, I've had a blast, you know, working for Guinness over there in Dublin or sitting in a booth with Sam Elliott, um, having him read lines that I've worked on and, and, um, man, the list goes on of like these, you know, being with Chris Sharma in Mallorca for, for a month, you know, I mean, I know this is more for climbing nerds, but like, I got to tell a quick story. About yeah. Yeah. That. I'm a climbing like, nerd. Go for it. Like Chris Sharma was working with him in Mallorca and, and all through Spain. And, and like, so he's, he's, he's like the, um, he's like Kelly Slater in climbing, you know, just for surfers to get a kind of handle on like he's, and so, um, just like surf spots, like if you're the first on something, you get, you get to name it. And so film break making put me in a position where like Chris is like, you know, um, uh, soloing deep water, soloing and putting up some stuff that's like, world class like this this one route he put up it's just like man it, it it's world class stuff and then him coming jumping in the boat and having me name name the route you know like that that kind of like surreal experience that i've missed swells for for sure but you know i i have really um i've really turned down a lot of work that just didn't feel a like it was a, a brand that uh, I believed in, um, and and then the, uh, or the creative was just for the world, you know. If it's and, and um, I've lost a lot of money doing that. Just saying, I don't, you know. I mean, I have definitely taken a few where I'm like, I can't believe I'm doing this. But the vast <laughs> majority of, of stuff that I've gotten to do um, has been stuff. I I think. I mean, yes, it's big business. Yes, it's um, it is what it is. But it's the the teams at at those places were look you in the eye type of people and it was mm. for um for stuff that you know uh, you know i drive a ford you know i need a ford i haul with a ford every day and so the chance to work with um with them like i'm honored you know my, mm. my in two weeks ago i was down in yuma fil working for john deere and you know um, it felt good. It felt good. I, I, I own two John Deere tractors. My dad drove one. My grandfather did. So um, if I can, if I can, um, you know, help tell their stories, I'm not, um, I'm not delusional. It's working for the man. You know, that's, that's, that's my hammer right now. You know, it was like, and, um, and I'm blessed and honored to get to work with some of the people that I get to work with just, Incredibly creative, incredibly just on it, people. And you, I find that the people um, in the in Hollywood um, that like are there for a long time, and um, when you when you're with them, um, they're salt of the earth people. You don't last long in that world um, if you're not salt of the earth. And you know, uh, like I said, look you in the eyes, kind of people when they talk. So I, 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 you know, not, because I'm able to live where I live and surf where I surf and be in this, you know, community, like I can jump into that world, no problem and come away learning a lot and sometimes making something I'm proud of, you know? Um, yeah. Yes. I like that that Scorsese line you referenced about <laughs> one for them, one for me. And I mean, that maybe yeah. is the, the most concise distillation of the pro surfing mentality anyway. It's like, all right, I'll do the catalog <laughs> shoot because they're going to send me to Indo or I'll do this contest because they're going to put me up in Hawaii for a month. Like, it's, I think that's that, that, that tracks pretty closely. Well, it's a bit rich of me to, to 
even bring up Scorsese's name is in <laughs> sure. anything I ever have done or will ever do. But just pointing out that that reference kind of made me, I mean, you know, it's a filmmaker's excuse to do commercial work is what it is. And of course, I, 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 I soaked it up wholeheartedly. It's interesting to hear you talk about the brand values thing. So I think that's been a thread throughout this conversation is just like oh, the, the realization or the prioritization of purpose. Um, and even hearing, you know, you recount um, Bruce Brown's story of just like, oh, like, you know, there's obviously there's all the benefits to doing this project. But then the thing I'm excited about is potentially these premieres revitalizing a culture or an economic hardship for this town. And, you know, when we're younger, we probably don't have as much agency with the brands that we partner with or the jobs we take or whatever, because we're not as um, experienced, we're not, we're not as, um, you know, valuable in a lot of ways. But as you've grown, it feels like you've probably had considerable more agency with the brands that you've decided to work with, whether it's in sure, filmmaking or sure. just ambassadorship. Yeah. The um, conversation we're having today, it's brought to us by Yeti. And one of the awesome things about this brand is not only like the products are incredible, you often hear people who are not Yeti ambassadors being like, oh, I use them anyway. Um, but they have such an interesting cross section of people, right? You know, they've got obviously surfers like Shane and Mick and your brother and John and Steph, but they've got climbers, they've got cowboys, they've got fishermen, they've got hunters, they've got all these things. So can you talk to us just a little bit about how you got connected with Yeti and what that experience has been like for you? Yeah, so <clears throat> my experience with Yeti uh, starts in the backcountry, packing horse and mules in with Graham Goodfield, one of my best friends. And he's a pack horse guy that works for the Forest Service and takes people up there and I've helped him over the years. And the 75 fits perfect in a pannier, the pack saddle, you know? And so we could fit like two 30 packs in a, in, on one side and then meat in the other side. And, and at the time, nothing, there was nothing like that, right? It was Coleman coolers that were like that. And it was, you know, and so I became aware of, of Yeti um, all those years back through um, Graham Goodfield. And then, but I had never really invested in, in, a, in a Yeti myself. And then fast forward, I was um, living off grid with two little kids, another one on the way on this like solar um, system that was so bad. It was like all plugged into car batteries. And I was traveling still at the time and my wife's like seven months pregnant. And she's like, I can't even keep cold milk, you know? And she's a, she's a warrior, she's badass. But I finally was like, man, I got to figure something out until I get this solar thing figured out. <laughs> so I hauled off and bought uh, my first Yeti and it was changed game changer, total game changer. You know, it was like, wow, if the solar, if we don't have our fridges, a Yeti is going to keep up stuff for a week, essentially, you know? So I was like, I was like all in. And then um, a filmmaker I've worked with for years, Scott Ballou, who's from Austin, called us and said, Hey man, it seems like you guys are tracking so well with what Yeti's into. Um, and I'm, I'm going to take a, a job there and helping tell their story. If you guys are into it, Roy and Ryden Cedars, um, the founders, the brothers, they were aware of what we're up to. And he said, Hey, I think we should work together. And because of my relationships with Bob Hurley, Al Merrick and Yvonne Chouinard, that are all like all those relationships were between, um, 15 and 20 year long relationships. So my brothers and I, like, I'm proud of the fact that we've, you know, we, those are long relationships and, and that we maintain to this day, you know, through, through all that. And so, um, I said to my brothers, I said, Hey, the fellas at Yeti coolers are like wanting to tell some stories. And, um, I said, well, we don't, you know, we don't work with or for people that we don't know. So we jumped on a plane like the next day and went out and hung out with, with um, Blue and, and Roy and Ryan Cedars, founders. And God, we sat there for hours and just talked about like intention and trajectory and, um, and, and uh, they were, 
they were incredible and just said, Hey, what would you do if you could help tell our story? And it was like, you know, in, in, in stereo, my brothers and I just came back and said, let us find the people that we look up to, the people that are inspiring us and go spend a week or two weeks with them and come back and tell their stories. And so we, and they said, great, do it. And it was like unfettered, man. The, like the folks at Yeti were like, we believe in what you guys want to do. Just go do it. You know? Um, and so that set off like 10 years of just going and just going, Hey, you know, that guy up North that does that thing. And all of us being like, yeah, that guy, that guy's, that dude's amazing. Well, let's just go spend time with him and he'll end up with, coolers and he's set and it's a like low impact you know experience for the fisherman or or the farmer or whoever you know cowboys or whatever and um and that was a really a really fun run you know we're still getting to do stuff with yeti still helping to tell stories but they're all based in sort of that um tack room you know harbor bullshit conversation you're having about something or somebody and um proposing it for the folks at Yeti and, and, you know, um, amazing support in, in the storytelling, um, that we get to do with Yeti. That's very cool. And all these years later, I'd imagine you're still using the product. Is there anything that's side of your go-to day to day? Um, my, so what I have noticed is that like, I use my hard coolers when I'm going to be out, out, right. You know, mm -hmm. I'm going to be, um, out, uh, where we're going to be doing breakfast, lunch, and dinner for like four or five days, or if we're going to be hunting or fishing and you, you know, that precious, um, meat, you know, you like, like that is such an important time to be able to take good care of, of what you've harvested. And so I'm using hard coolers for that mostly. Hmm. Um, and then the soft coolers and hoppers and that kind of stuff for the a daily basis where you can put, you know, a six pack and a sandwich and whatever, and just shove it under your seat, you know, like those are, that's just like, I really love and live by, by those. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's, you know, to have that, um, have the kind of, I will say like we, we use coolers every single day on the ranch here, you know? And so, um, I'm the, one of the fun things with Yeti is just getting all the prototypes, right? So the right. stuff that you're seeing out there, we've had for like a year, you know, and there's, um, there's a, a new cooler prototype that I just got from Yeti about 10 days ago, you know? And so that's part of our process too. We'll like, man, after like, <clears throat> the, the one thing that my brothers and I do when, when we are invited to be involved in the product testing is that we're brutal <laughs> in terms of like nitpicky we're so nitpicky. And so, um, the new cooler I have, like I did my report, you know, um, to the team in Austin on kind of how it's working for me. But I always end with like that asterisk of like, Hey, I want to live with this thing for a year and I will be able to dig deeper and deeper. And, and so, um, the communication with the folks at Yeti doesn't feel corporate. It feels like, um, I can call Mike or Joe or Bill or, any of those guys. And it's like, it's like, they understand like, like to a fault. Like I don't really give a shit about the sales. I would like, <laughs> when, when I talk to those guys, they know that I'm going to be talking about like specifics on like what works for us, you know? And so, yeah, that, that is, you know, sometimes you just, I always, you know, you go, gosh, this, how it's working is so smooth. You know, I hope that it goes on for, for um, a long time. And I feel like there's nothing, you know, better than working on a cooler with Yeti and the teams. And then like, whenever I see guys out using the stuff, you know, I always sidle up next to them and I just slightly be like, how's that, how's that, how's that cooler, you know? And, and um, kind of getting like the, you know, unfiltered, you know, kind of, uh, report from the guys that are, you know, that are swinging a hammer for a living that save up to go get out to the coast, you know, like I, I love hearing from those guys and, and um, I always push them to be like, what's the matter with it? You know, what would you do different? You know? And so to go from the coast and, and or the hills and people that are our commercial fishermen by trade, our pack horse 
um, when people buy trade um, and 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 take that unfiltered to to Yeti and not say, oh yeah, I know, well, you know, um, but that's just not selling. You know, I've never gotten that from Yeti. You know, oh, we we yeah, I know that that's great, but we can't move those. I've never gotten that once. You know, and so um, man, that's a it's been a, a good run and. Um, as we flew to Austin for that first time to be with Roy and Ryan and Joe and the whole team, I was, I, I remember thinking like, what's the, like, what is my motivation by helping tell this story? And really at the end of the day is like, what allows you to do the thing you love longer? Mm -hmm. One more day stay for that see if you're down in Baja and you and you think this wall might pulse the next afternoon but like all you've got is, in a normal you know in a normal setup you just got this soup of like beer and tacos you know after five days you know whereas like the idea of being like our 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 kitchen is so buttoned up like we can stay three more days if we want like that was that's always been my inspiration for for how can we keep doing what we love to do more longer stay out longer so with that is the sort of as the true north you know that's like kind of the compass i always try to filter it through you know how, how can we keep doing what we want to do very well said um before you go we reached out to the followers at instagram and at the lineup <laughs> pod we got a bunch of questions back for for chris malloy but we've we've whittled them down to three okay um, First question is from at Ben underscore Pereira, who asks, what does the future of surf films look like? Not to put you on the spot. That's a good question. I, I think that, I think that's a great question. I don't. So if we look at surf films as a, as a genre, like, so in my opinion, you know, you take everybody from, you know, all starting back with, you know, Don James to, through, Severson, Balzan, Sonny Miller, you know, really it comes down to um, an actual group of, of, of friends that, you know, like that are, that are are going out and looking for surf. The friends are surfing really, really well, you know, and then they're putting music that they love to that, editing it as well as they can. If you look at to, to varying degrees, that's not, that is what surf films are, right? So it's it's like uh, surf films. I'm quick to point out, like aren't chasing mavericks or hundred foot wave or whatever these things are. They're beautiful what they are, and they're the ones that the public actually reacts mm. to, and that they can be financially viable. But those aren't surf movies, you know. And again, I want to say that those are amazing for what they are. Um, but like a surf flick is like a crew going out and finding some new waves and, and just you, somebody in that crew is worth watching, right? I've always said that a surf film's job um, isn't to show you um, where spots are, or it's to, it's to I think personally, is to, to have surfers in waves that you'd wanna surf. Um, and so you can imagine yourself, you know, in, in those places and like, and, and lose yourself in, a dream of getting to go somewhere or, or inspire to, to, to use your rails differently. And, and so, and, and I, and I would also contend that that's, they're meant to be shared in person, you know, like that is that, that is what a surf movie is. So with that in mind, the future of this, of, of surf cinema, surf films, um, doesn't change. Um, you know, in, Instagram clips and all that stuff, they serve a different purpose which is showing you that what the cutting edge of what surfing is and that's, that's going to be in real time monetized and, you know, schematics are, and they serve their own purpose. It's for the surfer, they're still standing in a big barrel. Um, and for the powers that be that need to get what they need out of it, they're going to get their thing. Um, but that's, but that's not surf. That's not surf movies. It's not surf flicks, you know? So what, you know, call me, you know, what you want to hold out or whatever. But I, I believe, and I'm starting to see it is there's just some smart kids out there that see and understand the, the, the value in that community and culture hmm. that are, you know, I've even getting phone calls, you know, like from, from amazing 
um, kids out there that are like, just, they just want to like sit by the fire a little bit, you know, and talk about it. And I'm like, that's it. That's it. And then go tell your story, like your crew and your places and have your, you know, epiphanies and your failures and, and, and cobble it together. Don't let anybody tell you what you can do or who you have to put in there, do it your way. And then if you really care about surf film um, and, and you care about where you, where you sort of like fit in that lineage, you're going to go down to the local uh, high school and rent the auditorium, buy the beer for everybody and press freaking turn it on and hoot and holler. And that's it for me. That, that, that's it. And so I think the surf movie, the surf flick will be alive and well. It'll be alive and well forever because, because the kids, they need to do it. They need to, they need to sort of share their, their version, uh, their experience through film. Um, and there's so much talent out there. There's so many kids out there that are just like primed for it. You know, I would just, I would just encourage them to, if you look at like what, it was happening in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, um, up until the 90s, really, like, there wasn't, like, it was based on good surfing and what surfboards were, were, were ha what's happening in surf, surfboards. So you were getting to see surfing once or twice a year. So in that interim, surfboards had changed. Spots had changed. So there was that aspect of, like, getting to go and see what, like, I mean, the idea of surfing Emma Wood every day and then getting to go see Mike Ho, it just was like, it just blew our minds it just, you know, into that whole realm. And I would just say to the kids is like, tell your stories. 16 millimeter is so romantic. It's so cool. And I love it so much, but like, don't let the medium, like if you can tell a story and you can make a feeling, um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how you do it, you know, it, it, um, just get out there and tell stories. And then also take, there's, I, I would also offer like to aspiring surf filmmakers is like, there's, you can, you can make an homage to, to boards and to editing styles and to the medium you're shooting on. But like mimicry, I think I would warn the kids of, to like, this is your time. So if you spend your time between 18 and like 30 doing a reenactment, I think that you're selling yourself short. Um, I would offer is like take all the different boards and, 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 you know, like perfect example is like Mikey February. Um, he's, he's taking the best that, that from the last 50 years um, of, of, he's not riding boards to mimic anything. Right. And I would, I would put my brother Dan um, in that same realm. You know, he got some times for not riding a board the way um, it's supposed to be ride, ride ridden, you know, and like my retort is just like, with all due respect, <laughs> you because right. surf surfing is about a big part of it is about progression. You know, there's an O2 and a respect to the elders. And, um, and then there's just mimicry. And so right. I think, I think that the, the smart kids out there the and the really good surfers totally get that, you know, taking the, like you look at it like a Ryan Birch yeah. and like he's riding all this different stuff, but the commonality is he's going super fast and he's doing, you using his rails and doing turns like, um, and um, that is to me, like if I was going to, like, if somebody said dream up, like, what would you want to watch? You know, it's, it's yeah. something that's you like full respect for the past style is King. Um, but pushing it on how deep you can get on, 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 uh, how hard, you know, your, your rail work. Like I'm, you're looking back at, um, the people that you look back to were pushing it so hard at that time. So, you know, I got, I got lit up really badly one time by, by Terry Fitzgerald because I was riding this Greg Little displacement hole in the Maldives. And I thought he would be like, ah, oh, yeah, mate, like you're, you're, you're paying respect to like the old days. And I got on the boat after a really, I thought was a really good session. <laughs> and TS like, mate, I don't know what you're doing on this 
we figured out that doesn't work 30 years ago. And I was like, oh, no, man, I, I was trying to be, you know. So, and I mean, and therein lies just like in the big picture, like if surfing is getting you stoked, it's getting you stoked. Yeah. The end of this, end of the, end of the story, really. I, I like, I like the way you framed like looking back, but not like mimicking. It's almost that difference between like inspiration and nostalgia. Like yeah. you can pull inspiration out and then use it to create something special, but Nostalgia is, nostalgia is just kind of lazy and inauthentic sometimes where it's like, I'm going to dress like that person, talk like that person, be that person. So, you know what I mean? Where it's like, but then that's not, that's just a repeat. You know what I mean? That's right. That's just a repeat. And it's like, to be honest, it's like, yeah, well, when that guy was doing that at that period of time, that was really, really hard to do. Right, um, right. Yeah. And it was, nobody was doing that. So like, it's super significant, but to, to go on this, like, equipment that's actually been it's it's actually way different than what they were doing so mm. it's way easier and then to go out there and do the thing in the right trunks and the right thing is like um you know what people are stoked and having fun doing that like personally i don't give a shit about it you know like um, yeah that's fair uh and i think it's i think it gets a little more credit than it should get you know um, right <laughs> But man, there's so many good surfers out there right now. And like just the excitement of, uh, again, like, you know, you know, surfers like Mike February, Nat, Nat Young's youngest boy. Oh yeah. Uh, um, is it Bo? It's not Bo, is it? It's, Actually, um, no, that's this. I know the elder one. Bo I know who you're talking. Why can't I think of him now? God. Anyway, he rips. Just just taking taking power surfing like his dad did to the such new levels you know and no mimicry you know like um i think that that uh is just fun and again um i'm not deep into the surf world so i get to be a punter again i get to be an outsider <laughs> and so those are that's what i'm digging you know right. that's that's yeah. that's the kind of stuff that i'm digging and then i think there's also in big wave surfing you know you have this sort of side of, of, of big wave surfing, which is, um, you know, it's very mechanical. It's very based on face height and mm. based on as much gear as you can strap to yourself. Um, and it's, you know, people who don't surf are blown away by it. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, you know, but it's, um, to it's totally different, right? In a lot of ways, it's just a different so. world. And and, and I, I really want to say I'm not being like a hater on any of that stuff. Um, but like I think about you know like JoJo Roper and some of these kids, like they're still care, like they've got that that look in their eye, man. They still have that that thing that's been passed down. There's a direct lineage of of a lot of the guys, Cole Christensen, Ramon Navarro, like, yeah, yeah, they know where their roots are from and they care about it. And they have, they have conversations, you know, I've been there about the ethics of mm. how and why and what, and, um, and, and so, yeah, all that stuff, it's all still there, man. It's, it's all still there. And, and that's the beauty of surfing. That is such the beauty of surfing is that like, there's a trillion different versions of what surfing is to somebody and, 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 um, and it's okay. You know, it's not like, um, it's not a lead that you sign up for. Right. You, you know, you, if you don't fall in that, like you're out, you know, or you make a comment that doesn't fit a thing and you're out. Like if you look at the history of surfing, I think, you know, once it makes it to, um, California, you know, soon after it makes it to California, like it is about seeing the world your own way and not and being not being ashamed of it, you know. And and, and any all all the greats to me have that irreverence and that and that willingness to look who, however the world might see them, um, but be unrelenting in like their pursuit, you know. I mean, yeah. not too long ago, I was hanging out um, with my son; he's nine years old, and I look over and, he, and he's talking to this old guy and it's been like half an hour and they're just seem like best friends. And it's, it's, it's Bigler, you know, Steve Bigler, that guy's been living his own deal for 
better part of a century. And, and he still has that thing of just like frothing out with a nine year old kid on what the tides do, you know? So that, like that spirit's still there. It's, it's, it's still there. I, I think that, um, I think that, you know, once we try to over intellectualize surfing, um, it's kind of always, it's always, I can't help but laugh a little bit, you know, about it. I think, um, you know, uh, I was in Hawaii um, for Tamayo's passing or for, mm. for his service, and I got to spend a good amount of time with um, with Jock Sutherland, you know, and he likes to, he likes to talk. He's, a, he's really, he's, a, he's, he's really well read, you know, and he likes to like open it up to like meaning and to, mm. to um, how everything's connected, you know, but he does it in this way where um, he really, really, his humility and his understanding of his place in the physical world, like is so fleeting and, and like, just to like, just to listen to him. And of course I had, I had questions that I'd kind of set him up for, you know, stuff that he probably didn't know I remembered or, you know, his speech at a surfer pole thing. And, and so he knew I was, tra I was tracking with him, you know, and, hmm. and, and, you know, the takeaway is that, um, you know, you, he, he really is man. Like, like Jock is like, more focused on what the what the surf was going to be like in the morning, dropping off smoked fish to the house for the kids, um, and like all the other stuff just seems like you know being an absolute legend and icon in surfing and having such a huge influence on surfing. Um, I it really seems like he doesn't care and doesn't know and doesn't care, you know. And so you try to you try to channel those dudes, man. It's so often the case too, right? Because you get I get a way to think about it. Like if you 100% focused on the achievement or the legacy or the whatever, right? Or the reputation, you never actually get there in a sustained way. And it's always the people that are just focused on doing the thing, you know, are focused on yeah. the present that it's like, those are the ones that get remembered all the time, but it's a really good insight. And, um, uh, producer Miguel came through. It was Bryce. Bryce Young was who we were trying to think of before. Bryce. I don't know. I can think. Yeah, so if that doesn't age me right there when I say, what, "What's Nat's kid's name?" <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh. um, second question from at the line of pod is from at Tree Hat J who asks, "What was the heaviest surf session of your life?" Okay. Um, heaviest. The uh, heaviest. Um, I, I, I feel like the two, the, the, there's two kind of sessions for me. Um, one is going to be at Chopu. So in the early nineties, it wasn't, it wasn't a spot, right? I mean, we even, you know, we, we called Chopu Kumbaya because we'd stay with Rimana at Rimana's grandparents' house at Papara and there was this French cartoon that would play and the, the hero of the cartoon, his name was Kumbaya. And he had this like sonic boom that he could do with his voice. And it would just like shut everybody down. Like every, like in the cartoon, right? All the villains would just drop. So like, we were like that wave is like, it's like as powerful as the, as the, as the cartoon anyway. Um, so those first, you know, Chopu people don't realize it's super fun and doable when it's like, four feet, you know, it's, right. it's just a really perfect, um, once, you know, one or two section barrel and it doesn't, stop, so it, and it breaks like a normal wave. And when it gets to that, like, you know, six feet, um, you know, so double overhead, that's when the back just starts building, right? Like the faces does not get that much taller, um, the back. So the, one of the heaviest sessions I remember was in the evening, the swell pulsed out of the, out of the West that day. It had been more south coming down the reef, and I remember, um, yeah, like I, my my heart starts beating when I think about it. We imagine this if you can that you've never seen Chopu, you've never seen it. So our lives being dedicated to the pipeline, 
that was it, that was it, and that was all. And here we were in this little channel, you know, it was Brock and Briley and Noah and Imana, uh, Manoa, and watching the, this, this thing. And it was like, it was otherworldly. It truly, truly was. And, and you had, um, you know, the canyon or the, the valleys right there. And it was all just happening right in this thing. And then looking at each other and going, is it doable? I don't think so, you know, and paddling out and, and, you know, uh, it, until Laird got that wave, like right. we were, we were just dancing with the devil, like, and making some surprising ourselves, but that truly those early, early days at Chopu, um, and then, um, and the, the outer reefs, um, in, um, Hawaii, those were just so much water moving around. No, but. And it would be Brock, Ross Williams, Shane Dorian, Keone Watson. I remember then Wassel and Cole and those guys. There was a, and there's guys that I'm not um, naming, not on purpose. There's just, there was a few people, but just that massive amount of water and mm. just the perfection and the beauty of it. And we had given so much time to Waimea, which as a backsider is like, you know, I mean, you know, my, few waves in the eddy i cow like all i'm doing is just trying to get to the bottom and beat the explosion so to all of a sudden have these like 300 yard long waves and, and not have nobody there like i remember um being in the lineup and looking around and just going like i the, the, i didn't know this existed <laughs> you know i wanted to surf my map and get and, and and big water now i'm sitting out here and it's todd chester brock little um and Keanu Watson and just like to this day I'm like man I cannot believe what was in store for us and for surfing and 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 to be there without it it was nobody described it to you you know uh you you, you just sat in the lineup like, oh my god you know and and um yeah so those are those are early days at the Outer reefs in Hawaii and um and, and the and the early days of Chopu are the ones where like it really, you know, looking back on it, it feels kinda of silly to say, but like at that time, man, we were like, I'll die for this. I'll totally die for this. Like it it, it felt pure, it felt real. It, it wasn't being documented. And um we we sort of sensed that like man, this is this is a once in a lifetime experience and, and um it's like now or never. And I think we did that. We did stuff um, that, that well, it was like, there wasn't, there was an extra sort of something bigger that was just like, you, you just go, just do it. Just do it. Put your head down. And frick, I would never get near that right now. You know? <laughs> but right. I, you know, yeah. So those are, those are the heavy ones for me. It's awesome. Uh, last question we pulled is from Et Too Cool from Megan, who asks, what is one thing you've learned from your life in nature that you want to pass down to your kids? That's mm -hmm. a good question. Yeah, so, so nature is, is, a, is an interesting being, if you will, in that, um, you know, I always feel like um, with the mountains and with the ocean, um, you know, you're gonna if you can fall in love with those early in your life i think that you're 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 really lucky because in life your friends even family business partners like you're gonna have times in your life where you feel like everything's against you mm. nothing's working out and the ocean and the mountains are like always there where you can always clear your head in that in 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 that um those scenarios, you know, we, we, you do know that you will feel like F everybody in your life. You will. And, the, and that is always there to get your head straight. Um, and, uh, and it's also the ultimate, if like, if you, if you really immerse yourself in those worlds, um, just the, one of the biggest gifts we can have is this humility, you know, and yeah. like understanding, you know, in a, anthropomorphic or anthropocentric world 
you know, it's like, it's just this constant pull to be, for make everything about me, about me, about us. It's just, it's just like debilitating, you know, mm-hmm. of, of, of this, of our understanding of where we fit. Um, and, uh, and what nature does, what, what surfing does, um, and what the mountains do is like very quickly remind you that you're like a, a flea on the ass of a donkey at best, you know? So humble the fuck up, start soaking in what is, 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 you know, all around you. And if you act out of line, nature will put you back on track, you know, we'll put and, and I, and I find a lot of these, the, in, in our culture now, we have a lot of, of poor kids whose parents are not letting them, you know, uh, get a little cold or a little tired or a little hungry or a little frustrated or a little bit scared. And these poor kids at 18 are walking out into the world and they're screwed and they're useless. They're useless. And um, so na- nature really does it, is the ultimate in, in, um, in teaching humility, you know, in teaching you that there is nothing, uh, nothing free. You know, so that's a great what, answer. You know, that's what the outdoors, uh, and that's what it's given me. Well, thanks to everyone that wrote in at, at the lineup pod. We're now down to our final segment. It is the lightning round. So these are 10 questions for you to answer as quickly as you can. Okay. All right. If you could only have one board set up for the rest of your life, single fin, twin fin, thruster, quad, bonzer, or finless, which would you choose? Yeah, I would say for sure, um, a, like a twin fin, a twin fin with a little, a little bit, a little bit more foam, a little bit longer, because you can surf that at outer reef and you can surf that in knee high waves. No problem. No problem. Yep. Coffee or tea? Coffee, for sure. Burrito or pizza? Burrito. Last book you read? Last book I read, I think I read, um, I think I read Empire of the Summer Moon. Um, right before that, I read a, a book that anybody that lives in California should read is called um, Cadillac Desert. Um, and then um, I'm super. Uh, excited to dive into a book um, called The State of Fire, written by Obi Kaufman. Um, incredibly prolific naturalist, artist, uh, writer, who um, has done these like field notes, books on our watersheds, um, agriculture in California, it's West Coast driven. And uh, his new book uh, uh, called The State of Fire, which I am gonna devour. Um, because that is like where we live. This is such an interesting, interesting time. And like the misunderstanding of fire and, and, and it's, um, very important role in our, um, native plant species and our, and, and our biomass in our region, um, is such an un- misunderstood, um, topic. So anyway, <laughs> that was not a one word answer, was it? No, that was a, those are great answers. I'm writing them all down. Um, best surf film ever. Woo-hoo. Honestly, I, I, uh, for me, um, I really, I, I, I would say Pacific Vibrations resonates with with me so much because it was like Severson was like shooting beautifully that he was like easing into some sort of social and environmental sort of um, topics, but not like pushing it down your throat. He was like interviewing people and going different places and, you know, and like just the way that he had, like he would, the way he would frame is like, he would always have foreground and background. So it gave you this feeling that you could be there, you know? And, and um, to me, uh, and just that, that space with, what was happening in surfing Rick Griffin and everything like that one. Definitely, I, I would 
I would say, um, had a big influence on me. And I can just watch a million times and just think about what was happening in the world at the time and what surf, you know, just like that. The feeling in surfing that I get from the film is like these guys were hungry and wanting to uh, break away um, from the norms of surfboards and culture and and everything that was happening. And I think, um, yeah, yeah, just like vibrations. But man, I got like <laughs> bars that are like right there that I love, you know. It's a well articulated answer, though. What is one wave you never have to go back to? That I never get to go back to or have to go back to? Have to. Like, you're like, oh, I've, I'll, 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 when, if it's take it or leave it for me, I'm okay. going to leave that Okay, one. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think I'm going to use that as an opportunity to issue an apology um, to a country. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here we go. The international so, relations. So, so I would say, I would say in the past, I would say like, um, so I had a really rough time in Peru one year. <laughs> and I would think like that would be like not going back there, you know, but like really I want to say is that like, um, like uh, it was, so what had, what happened was, was um, I was down there with Riley and Robbie Page, right? When he got out of prison, they are having acid in Japan. Right. And I think Timmy Baker, Magu de la Rosa and like we just got like the craziest sick from the like we were sick sick for a long time like um I'll do there was so and then we went up to the spot in the desert and camped like camped for days to get this wave we found and like first session stand-up barrels I just hit the bottom and just got like I think 60 sea urchins from my neck oh. to my ass to my hands like gnarly and it was up by chikama like towards that way yeah and um so i'm just like my pants covered in sea urchins <laughs> like we went up to cusco machu picchu and just had like altitude sickness briley puking i'm puking pagey's just like on some quest i don't know what he was we didn't we bucked horns so then i get back down to Lima there, and, and there's a, I think it's called Punta Rocas, like beautiful little, like right cobblestone point break. Yep. And um, I paddle out and I'm like, what, what is that board? That's my board. And it was this like hand shaped owl that was mine. My brother Keith had been there the, the year before and won the QS. And when he was on stage with champagne and stuff, somebody swiped that board. So, so, and he didn't really tell me much about it. He's like, yeah, I didn't bring that board back, whatever. Right. I see my board in the lineup. Mind you, I'm like, just, just a really hard trip. And it wasn't Peru's fault. I met wonderful people. But so then I go and I'm like, I'm getting my board back. Right. And I can't speak Spanish very well. And those guys. So anyway, I get into it with these local surfers because they're trying to keep the board. And I'm like, F all y'all, like, you know, which is, was dumb for me to do to begin with. Um, but like, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry that I was um, disrespectful that day in the lineup in Peru. I, I owe you guys an apology. And, um, and so you're not on my um, spots I don't have, go, have to go back to. I want to go back and be a more stand-up individual. And who knows, maybe that board's still there, but. <laughs> maybe. That's a great story. Um, That's the story. I wasn't answering your question. Spot no. that I don't have to go back to. Um, And I don't know. I don't know. I love, I love, I like, I don't. That's yeah. fair. A lot of people have that response. They're like, yeah, I'm, I'm good. I'm, yeah, I'm, I don't have anywhere that I really, I'm trying to think of something. Um, some people know right away. They're like, absolutely. No, you know, and I'm like, right, it's good. Yeah. Well, mine was Peru, but, but right. I, I've, yeah. I've matured. You've evolved. I've realized yeah. it, wasn't, it wasn't Peru's fault. And I'm highly appreciative of the Peruvians and, Magoo and all those guys, and, and uh, I, I um, could have been a little more stand up and, and just let them. That was I should have considered a tax, right? Like a, a like a really good Almeric as a tax. Yeah, universal tax. You're like, yeah, yeah right. I should have I should have done that. But well, you know, as you said, when you're younger, the perspective is not there. I, you know, well, that who, board who, it was us. right, and it really honestly came down to like that board was so good. 
<laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. If it was a, if it was like, 11, I you'd be like, man. <laughs> Keith was on a roll. I think he made the CT that year or something. And I was just like, right, right. this thing with you is insane. And um, so it was really, it really was the, that it was, I was emotional about that surfboard. <laughs> I like it. Uh, if you only get to surf one way for the rest of your life and you can dream cast it, perfect conditions, just you and your friends, whatever, which wave would it be? Um... Let's see. It would probably be. Um, well, you know this. You know I'm not going to tell you where. My, we can where be, we'll, we'll bleep it out. Producer Miguel's good at that. <laughs> no, uh, I, I, yeah, bleep that whole part out. But like, <laughs> um, I would say, okay, I, I would, okay, if I was going to surf one wave and like I can surf it every day forever. Um, it's, and I'll say where it is and try to describe it because we didn't name it. I don't think. Um, but in new Caledonia, there's the reef passes are way out. And we, we, we were coming back from this girthy left that we were trying to surf. And like two miles in from the reef pass, there was this like knoll, this like seamount of reef that came up and swell would come in. We were like, what is that? Let's go see what that is. And you would take off. So it was a circular reef and you would take off at the top and it would be like crumbly and like knee high. And like, and then as the wave went around the seamount, it would grow to overhead barreling and offshore. <laughs> and you would, and so it'd just be like cruisy, cruisy, and then you'd surf through this big giant slingshot, and then you would kick out almost where you took off. Oh wow! So for an old man to get that kind of a wave and then not really have much of a paddle out would be <laughs> kind of ideal. Um, and uh, yeah, man, like I have a bunch of spots that I've kept to myself for a couple of decades, but now I'm telling people about them because they do take like you know you got to have their initiative and you got to kind of have some balls and so yeah i mean if, if i if anybody's curious i've got a good handful of really sick slabs that like they just need uh somebody who's just up for it you know haven't been surfed in a decade um that are proper world-class slabs and there's nobody around we got to put some sort of like you know testing barriers between the public getting to you to get these answers you know like you know Ra's al Ghul up on the mountaintop in the Himalayas <laughs> or whatever like someone's got to you got to do something you can't just text Chris that's what I'm saying <laughs> um, uh, next question best person to share a lineup with best person to share a lineup with I think I undoubtedly my brothers because to this day I'm a total wave hog around them like they don't they just know like I'm going <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and it, you know, we don't get to surf every day together like we do, but I, I, I will say, man, I just like, I always forget, you know, and then I go surf with my brothers and I'm like, man, really, like you guys are my, some of my favorite surfers, you know, it just, it, I really love surfing my, with my brothers and, and, uh, yeah, yeah, there's a, there's a, a guy that surfs around, um, around uh, I like okay so yeah there's a guy named Josh Farborough who I rarely get to see surf but I always just appreciate his lines and power and you know um, his approach to the lineup and way of being is just super super cool you know um, there's a handful of them I, I'm, I'm definitely given to like having a lot of heroes you know I always I always have like I think a lot of people that I even know, you know, or see and stuff that they don't realize how much I idolize them, you know, they really don't. And uh, so, I don't know, I got to have my heroes, you know, always to keep me going. I like it. Uh, worst person to share a lineup with? Worst person? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, uh, let's see, it's specifically, um, gosh, you know, it's, it's, um, let's see, I'm trying to think of somebody like something good here um, because really like the guys that are like 
you know, I mean, I don't have to deal with anything with anybody. But I, I, all the pecking orders that I've struggled in, like I'm, I'm, I, I know my place and in, in where I serve in the lineups, and everybody knows their place, and so I don't have, like, there's not a daily like hustle, you know? Right. It's more of an understanding. Um, and then the, the the gnarlers and stuff, like I'm not saying their names, that's for sure. <laughs> but I don't really have that kind of thing anymore. To, I mean, I, I think I'm better off just describing that, like, you know, the type, you know, like, and it's just, it's just that, that's a classic, uh, you know, character that um, really sees themselves um, differently in the lineup than everybody else, you know, and, and they just sure. don't, you know, they don't understand that like a healthy lineup is a lineup with order, you know, and that if, you know, I remember back in the day, it was a funny thing that just came to mind as like surfing down in San Diego um, with Taylor Steele's mom and uh, some guys like totally being disrespectful to her in the lineup. And like, I remember paddling up um, to these guys and being like, you don't, you don't understand. Like she's been surfing here before you were born and she doesn't take too many waves. But when she goes and she turns around to go, it's like just her. Like, don't look, don't think like just those, just those simple things of like just a understanding a lineup. And I, and I think, um, yeah, I think that the more what, what kids, what, what, the, what, what is like being sort of put out there, right. Is that like, you know, you can go to websites and see rules for surfing and you can, your surf coach can t- teach you rules, but like, just like anything in life, like you do it all day, every day and you do it for a long time. There's an understanding that's so next level that is, that, that, that renders all the vitriol and all the, you know, litigation and it takes care of itself if you let it, you know, it takes care of itself if you let it. So. Yeah. That's a great answer. Uh, last one. Finish this sentence. I will next achieve a state of happiness by. <laughs> I mean, you know, if I'm going to be super honest, like these days is like, uh, man, I am so happy um, if I get up at six, go for a swim, you know, right? And and when the when the um, sun's rising, I'm I'm already toweling off, and um, got coffee going. Kids are doing what they're supposed to be doing, you know, like. And I was like that right now to me is just like a gift and I'm so appreciative for it. And, you know, if you start, if I start my day right and, and, um, you know, uh, then, then all of a sudden I feel creative. I feel, you know, I'm not burdened by all the, it gets crazy in your head when you get up at, you know, eight o'clock and dive into a Danish, you know, like the, the, if you, if, if I you know stay away from that, which I'm not really drawn to anyway, but like, you know, you just you just regress, and, and if you you start your day and watch that sun come up, you know, like don't you, you know you're not going to the computer to see what the weather's doing, but rather sitting outside and watch the sun come up. Like, man, to me that's like, and I'm fifty, I'm fifty. I'm like, all I ever wanted to do was be able to have my own little piece of dirt, and um, and and uh, kind of you know steward steward that piece of dirt with the kids and stuff and like uh yeah do i have moments when i hear there's a big swell coming to chopu or to hawaii like i still have that like oh you know but you know i'm quick to remind myself i'm like man this is a you you know you pulled all that stuff off and stayed in one piece and like you know this is this is be happy where where, where i'm at you know yeah. Good for you. So 6 a.m. tomorrow, so it'll happen pretty quick. So we're <laughs> into that. But uh, Chris Malloy, I-, I cannot thank you enough for your time and your stories and your insights. I uh, really appreciate you coming on the podcast. And um, yeah, thank you for continuing to do storytelling in, in whatever medium is inspiring you because it-, it inspires us. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thanks, Dave. Thanks so much. I, I really enjoyed, um, you know, getting to catch up. And um, yeah, I kind of, it's a treat for me because we're um, up. On, I'm up on my little hill, and I don't see a lot of surfers, and get to, to talk about surfing stuff, which I, I really enjoy doing. It so thanks for uh, 
thanks for taking the time and thanks for the folks that wrote in with their questions. I hope I answered them. Um, and uh, yeah, well, thank, thanks again. <laughs>